Abba, our Father in heaven, Daddy, we worship you today. We recognize that you loved us long before we loved you. That in our brokenness, we've wandered, but in your grace and love, you've pursued us. And when we turn our hearts back to you, we always discover that you've never left us. You still dwell in us by your spirit if we put our faith in you through Jesus. And so you're with us. God, speak your love to us. Speak your truth to us. Unfold your word to us today as we look at this glorious, mysterious, sometimes confusing, but powerful and practical book of Revelation. Speak to our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So John the Apostle, who walked with Jesus, part of that inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John, who are so close to Jesus. Years have gone by. He stood strong for Jesus. He's been basically thrown in prison. In this case, prison is on an island. It's a prison island. He's been brutalized, attacked, and treated horribly for following Jesus. And while he's on this island, God gives him this vision. He doesn't give him a written book to read. He paints a picture in his mind and his heart. It's, it's unveiled that, that Jesus himself reveals what will be the end of all things, the consummation, the conclusion of all things. And for some people, that picture, if you read it, I think the wrong way and don't take time to really look at what it's about, can get kind of troubled and anxious. I had a couple people send me notes this week telling me that they actually were so traumatized by the book of Revelation as children because of the way it was preached and how it was taught to them. One person said, will you let me know if I should even watch the sermons for these next nine weeks? Because I've been through, been through counseling, I've been through things because it was so terrorized by this. And I said, Absolutely. Because the book of Revelation is not given to terrorize us. It's given to show us how all things end, but it's given to give us a hope and a confidence in the goodness and the grace of God. It's given to show us that God wins. And until the dust settles, hang in there. Hold on to Jesus. Never stop following him. Last week, we looked at Revelation chapter 1. If you weren't here, go online and watch that message. Today, we're looking at Revelation chapter 2, the first seven verses, and a portion of Revelation chapter 7. Each week, we're going to look at kind of part of the letters to the churches that sort of were to local churches in the days, in the days that this was written, but also we'll look at parts of the revelation, the vision that God paints for us. So our message today is, I saw heaven open, this picture of God opening heaven and show us what's going to be. And then the subtitle is, The Value of Intolerance and the Danger of Lost Love. So that's not a sermon titled The Value of Intolerance. We should never value intolerance. Actually, we should. And before you get nervous and kind of jump off the bus and say, I'm not going to listen then, I, I, I want to let you know in this message, I'm going to talk about the fact that every one of us believes there's moments, there's some things we should be intolerant of. Some things are so wrong, some things are so damaging that we don't all say, oh, that shouldn't be happening. We'll get to that in a moment. But also... The danger of lost love, this warning, don't lose your first love. If you're a follower of Jesus, follow him with all your heart. Love him in deeper and growing ways. Now, you will discover if you walk with Jesus for any length of time, once you become a Christian and you start walking with Jesus, you will discover that holding to the truth is costly and can be hard in our world. But it is the journey of every Jesus follower. If you're going to follow Jesus... There's times you're going to have to hold to the truth and count the cost. Because in a sense, and I was talking about this a little bit earlier in the giving back moment, there's a current to culture. And culture is always kind of flowing. And in most cultures, in most places, that flow is kind of away from the things of God and away from the person of Jesus. It's not like that culture just pushes us right into the arms of Jesus. Culture usually is flowing away. And sometimes it's kind of flowing gently and you hardly notice, you know. And sometimes it's like rapids and you're going, whoa, man, things are really moving against the things of God. But if you stand for Jesus, if you hold to his, to his calling, you're going to have to bump up against some of those things. As a brand new Christian, I was 16 years old, and I worked at Munchie's Pizza, making pizzas. And um, the first time I had a conversation with this guy, Mark, who also worked there, his first line to me was, you get drunk? That was his first thing he said to me, you get drunk? And I was 16. I told, I told him the truth. I said, no, I quit drinking when I was 13. That's a whole other sermon. I'll tell you about that later. But I said, no, I don't, I don't drink anymore. And he says, well, you get high? You do drugs? And I said, no, I don't do drugs. And he kind of looked really nervous. And he goes, well, you sleep around, right? You have sex, you know. With... And I said, actually, I, said, I have a girlfriend, but no, we don't have sex. And he asked a deep theological question. 
Why? <laughs> Why? Why don't you do all that stuff? I said, you really want to know? And I told him about the one who's changed my life, the love and the grace of Jesus. And, and it was against the flow. <laughs> that wasn't how he saw the world. But, but there's moments like that. Uh, even in the denomination, the church denomination that I was ordained in, that I pastored in as a young pastor, there were points at which there were leaders in the denomination who were questioning things like the authority of the Bible and salvation through Jesus. You think, well, why are you, to me, why are you even a Christian or why are you even a pastor and a leader in a church if you don't believe what the Bible teaches? But they were questioned. So I pushed back. I disagreed. I, was a, I wasn't tolerant of their wrong belief. And I was a young pastor, and they were older denominational leaders. And you know how I got branded? Oh, he's full of hate. He's mean and nasty and hateful. I wasn't. I didn't yell or scream at anybody. I just was like, this is wrong. Well, you're, I, I, you know, here's the thing. When I became a Christian, they gave me one of these. It's a Bible. And I said, this, if we, 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 we're either in or out. We either believe it or we don't. And so, and so but I found out that, that when you stand for Jesus, even sometimes in the church or Christian circles, there can be pushback. And so, so now Jesus gives us revelation, and he wants to share it with these churches, these seven churches in the book of Revelation. And what you need to know is these seven churches were real churches that existed at that time. Because in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, there's these little kind of epistles or little short little letters to each of the churches. And it kind of says, hey, here's where you're doing really well. Here's where you need to work on some things and get things better. And there's these letters to the churches. So if you look at this map that you see on the screen, you see it on your screen at home or on your phone there at home, um, the, the red dots there show seven churches. Now, what's interesting is that when you read the letters of the churches, they're put in a certain order, going clockwise from on the clock of the dots there from about you know, nine o'clock on the left there in the city of Ephesus. The first letter is to Ephesus. The next one's to Smyrna. The next one's to Pergamum. Then Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and then Laodicea. In that clockwise order. Why? Because when God inspired this and when it was all written down, it was taken to each of those churches. And the natural way to travel from church to church is going from Ephesus to Smyrna. It's just, that was actually the circuit of churches. And the book of Revelation, and, and then they would read the introduction to each church, and probably all the introductions to the churches, but then one church could hear about the other church being challenged or how they were doing well. And then the vision that John experienced. And so today we're going to look at the letter that was written to the city of Ephesus. And you see where Ephesus is right there? It's right on the waterway and the land. And so, so the city of Ephesus was, was an interesting city. It was sort of a cultural center. It was a center of culture in the ancient world. They called it the crossroads of civilization because there were trade routes that went that, that kind of up north, north and south and then east and west, but stopping in Ephesus. There was nowhere else to go from there. And then seaways that went out from there. So it was like the center of culture and trade. It was considered the supreme city in all of Asia in the ancient world. The Roman governor had a home there and lived there much of the year. Major highways traveling through there and the, the temple... And the statue to Artemis or Diana, the, 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 in the Greco Roman, the, the Greeks called the, their, this goddess Artemis, the Romans called her Diana. And she was the fertility goddess. So there were about 2,000 priests and priestesses and cult prostitutes. Part of their religion was prostitution. So in this cultural center, it's not just a center of culture in the ancient world, but it's also a cesspool of the ancient world. And oftentimes, where you have cultural centers, when everything kind of flows into that, everything flows into that. You have this cultural center that becomes somewhat of a cesspool. One of the ancient philosophers who lived in Ephesus wrote these words about his own city. He said, the inhabitants of this city, the inhabitants of Ephesus, were fit only to be drowned and that he could never laugh or smile because he lived amidst such terrible uncleanness. Now, this wasn't a Christian philosopher. This is a secular philosopher, but he said, he said, it's bad. It's become a cesspool. That's where this church is that Jesus is speaking to and that, that, that the book of Revelation is read to, this church. There was a time, it was a time of rapid cultural change, rapid political change, and, and, and sort of in that place, the cultural flow away from God and towards godlessness was moving faster and faster and faster. Sometimes there's times in human history where it just feels like, man, it, you know, things are meandering slowly away from God, or man, it's becoming like rushing waters, pushing people away from the things of God. And so, so that was kind of the reality in the city of Ephesus. And I just I want to give a side note here to parents with kids, and especially kids that are becoming young adults. Um, understand that there is a culture to not just our overall culture, but different places. 
And if you have kids moving towards college age, you know, post high school, moving out of your home, moving towards college age, I want to encourage you as parents, be careful of the culture of where you put your kids. And be careful of, of what's, where it's flowing. So well, I went to school there 30 years ago. It was great. It may not be the same school it was 30 years ago. Well, they say have the same mascot, same football uniforms. It may not be the same culture. And in many of those institutions, the culture is moving, moving rapidly. So all of a sudden, you put your kids in that culture, and your kids just go, well, I'm, I'm not going to go against God. I'm just going to tread water. Let me ask you a question. When you're treading water in a stream that's moving downstream, what happens when you're treading water? You slowly start moving downstream. And all of a sudden, you go, whoa, I don't even know where I am anymore. I have such a heart for this next generation. And as parents, as grandparents, not only pray for them, but know the culture. And if you're going to put your kid in a culture that's flowing strongly away from God, you better have taught them how to swim against the current really hard. And they better be committed to swimming against that current. Or you're going to find, you're going to find all of a sudden that, that, that semester break or after one or two or three years, this kid who loved Jesus and who loved you has floated way downstream. But that was the, that, that's the city of Ephesus. It's, it's, it's a cultural center, but it's a mess. And then God inspires these words, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. So as you listen to these words, and this is sort of the, the little, little mini letter that's read to the church in Ephesus before they hear the vision of Jesus, all right? Here's what we read. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. We learned last week, we know that's Jesus. That was part of the vision of Jesus. So these are the words of Jesus, verse 2. I love this. He says to the people in this church, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. Man, you're hanging in there. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. He's, he's actually praising them. I'm praising you that you cannot tolerate wicked people. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but they're not. And you have found them false. False. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and you have not grown weary. Man, you have hung in there in a difficult time. You have swam against the current. Look at verse four. Yet I hold this against you. So now he's blessed them, but now he says, but now, I, but yet I hold, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. That first love for Jesus, that passion for Jesus, that love for people, it had kind of cooled off. Look at verse five. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent, turn around, and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, we know what the lampstand is, the church, because Jesus said, let me explain the mystery. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. He, sa he says, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Your church will be gone. If your church walks away from me, uh, your church will be gone, right? And look at verse 6. But you have this in your favor. Here's a good thing. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. There's some things that people do that are wrong. We'll look at that in the next couple of weeks. With these, these different kind of false cult beliefs that was getting sucked into the church. And he's saying, you're able to stand against that. And then I love how it ends in verse 7. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God the hope of heaven, as we endure, as we hold to faith in Jesus. Jesus, we pray as we open up this passage, as we look at what you're saying to us, we pray that you'll speak to our hearts, speak your truth, that we would love you more, that we would love your truth, that we would hold your truth, whatever we face in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you begin the passage, you begin the start of the passage, we learn that the one who holds the seven stars and walks among the seven golden lampstands is Jesus. It, it, he's the one speaking to the church. And this, Jesus is the one who speaks to every one of these seven churches. It's a word from Jesus for his church. Now, this was given to Ephesus in the ancient world. But I believe that each of these letters holds truths that apply to us today. And so God, as God is speaking, as Jesus speaks to the church, we can listen kind of over their shoulder to what he taught them, and we can learn some of those same lessons in our own lives. So just a couple insights from this, the beginning part. First of all, here's one lesson I learned as I look at this. That Jesus rules over the spiritual world. He rules and reigns. It says he holds the seven stars. What are the stars? Jesus said they're the angels of the churches. Jesus holds the spiritual world in his hands. That's our Jesus. He rules and reigns over everything, including the spiritual world. That there's angels that are watching over these seven churches. Now, I've had people ask me, well, if, there were, if there's an angel watching over each of the seven churches in the ancient world, does that mean there's an angel watching over Shoreline Church? 
And here's my answer. I'm not sure. My suspicion is yes. But I'm really careful not to fill in the blanks when Jesus doesn't fill in the blanks because I don't want to act like I'm smarter than Jesus because guess what? I'm not smarter than Jesus. But each of these churches had an angelic being watching over these heavenly messengers watching over them. But Jesus rules over all of that. And then I love this. It says he's, he, he's the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. What's the picture? Well, the lampstands are the churches. Where's Jesus? Walking among the churches. Is Jesus present here right now? Absolutely. Whereas people gather, he's there in the midst of them. We can know that. When you're at home, Jesus is there with you. We may at times wander from Jesus, kind of float down the river and kind of wander away from him, but he never leaves us. He's always near. He's always with us. He's always at work. And he's here now. So John has this vision, and, and I want you to turn now for a moment to Revelation chapter 7, and we're going kind to of, kind of dip into the broader part of the, kind of the vision part of the book of Revelation. And we're going to look at part of that vision each week as well as the letters of the church is part of the vision. So in Revelation 7, 15, we have this picture of those who, it says, who come out of the great tribulation, this time of great tribulation and struggle and pain. Some have died, some have been martyred and killed for their faith, but they're before the throne of God. So it's kind of showing us this vision of those who've, who've stood strong in their faith, who've died in faith, and who are with Jesus. And I love this picture. Again, remember, the book of Revelation is meant to be seen and heard and experienced. Not dissected, but experienced. So just let this picture form in your mind from Revelation 7.15 of those who have come out of this great tribulation who are now before God. Therefore, verse 15, Revelation 7, therefore, they are before the throne of God. And they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. I love that. Here's God Almighty sheltering his people with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. These are desert people. They understand the heat of the sun. He says they'll be sheltered from that. And then picture this in your mind, verse 17. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. The lamb will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Can you see Jesus present, ruling and leading his people? the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the good shepherd who watches over us all the time. That's our Jesus. Again and again in the book of Revelation is a vision of Jesus. We saw one of them in, John, in, in John's vision in Revelation chapter one. We see another one here in chapter seven. We're gonna see a whole series of visions of Jesus in the weeks to come. And we should get this picture in our mind. The Lamb who takes away the sins of the world on the throne but he's also our good shepherd. And when you read this vision, if some of you, your mind would go to Psalm 23 and he will lead them to springs of living water. Just a sense of God as our good shepherd watching over us. The hope that that brings, the comfort that that brings. That's why it breaks my heart when I get letters from people saying, I, I was taught the book of Revelation in such a way that it just created terror and anxiety for me. It didn't bring, brief, it didn't bring peace or hope or a deeper love for Jesus. It just terrorized me. The book of Revelation, is not, you know, it's not meant to be a roadmap for us to figure everything out because if God wants to figure everything out, he would have told us. And a lot of people say to me, you know, Pastor, when do you think Jesus is going to return? Now, I'll tell you this. If you, say, if you came to me and said, Pastor, do you think that Jesus could return in the next two weeks? I'd say, yes, I do. I do. If you say, well, Pastor, do you think Jesus could return two months from now? I'd say, yes, I do. Well, Pastor, do you believe that Jesus could return in two years from now? I'd say, yeah, I believe that could happen. So what if you came and said, well, Pastor, do you think Jesus could be returning in 200 years from now? I'd say, yes, I believe that could be the case. Pastor, do you believe that Jesus could return 2,000 years from now? You know what I'd say? Yes. Because the bottom line is, everybody lean in, I don't know. <laughs> Some pastors figured it out and wrote a book, and then they were wrong. That's happened, and they've sold millions of books that were wrong. I don't need to write a book about that because I got this one right here. And you know what Jesus said? I am coming soon. You know when he said that? 2,000 years ago. 
Okay? Could Jesus return today? Yes. Could he return 2,000 years? Yes. Our job is not to figure it out. And I've had people say, I, I know you can't know the day or the hour, but I know it's going to be in the next two or three years. I'm like, well, Jesus said no one knows. You know what Jesus said? Not even the Son himself, only the Father. So when someone says, oh, only the Father, not Jesus, but I know, I get really nervous, right? So I'm not going there, but I will tell you this. The book of Revelation is given and the apocalyptic writings in the scripture that you find in the book of Thessalonians that you find in different places, it, I, I think it's meant to give us a picture that he will return, confidence until then, so we hold on to him until that day comes with all of our strength. That's what he wants for us. So let's just think through this book a little bit. Let's think through some of the lessons, getting the message. So we got the vision. We got a picture of Jesus ruling and reigning, ruling over all, walking among the, the lampstands, holding the, 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 the seven stars, the, holding the, the angelic beings in his hand. But what's, the, what's some messages, what's some lessons we can learn? Here's the first one, found in verse two of Revelation chapter two. God delights when his people serve him and pour out their lives for his glory and hang in there even when times are hard. Jesus says, I know your deeds. I know your hard work. I know your perseverance. Can you hear Jesus say that to you? I know you're working hard. I know you're hanging in there. I know you're persevering. Jesus delights when we keep following him even when times are tough. I think Jesus would say to a lot of people here and online, listen, I know it's been a tough two years, but you're still worshiping me. You're still following me. You're still hanging in there. Good job. You're still serving me. Keep pursuing me no matter what you face. Also in verse two, we learn this lesson. God expects his followers to know what is true and good and stand against false teachings and deception. And in those moments, intolerance can be good and intolerance can honor God. Jesus says to the church of Ephesus, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked, cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. He says, when there's false teaching going on, you should stand against it. Well, but, and some, some of you have been taught, especially younger people, tolerance is always good and intolerance is always bad. First of all, that just doesn't make any sense at all. Nobody really believes that. That's why people say, well, you people say you're tolerant, but you're actually intolerant. People are pointing fingers and accusing people of who's tolerant or intolerant. Here's the truth. We're all intolerant of certain things. Let me make this clear. Imagine a little kid, for a, little, a little, little boy for, for Christmas gets a Red Ryder BB gun, all right? Somebody says, well, you could put your eye out. Anybody, anybody remember the Christmas story, right? Okay, gets a Red Ryder BB gun. And they, live right, in, they right, live right here in Monterey. So they go down to Carmel Beach and they start shooting dogs on the beach with their Red Ryder BB gun. Who's gonna tolerate that? Raise your hand if you're... No, no, behave yourself. I see you're going to raise... No. So, no, no dog owner in Carmel is going to go, oh, it's just a kid having fun shooting BBs at my dog. It's not going to hurt. It just stings and they, they whimper a little bit. Nobody's going to do that. We're going to all become very intolerant very quickly, right? So suppose somebody says to me, hey, I, I met your wife Sherry at church today. She seems, she seems like a nice lady. I was going to ask her out on a date. <laughs> Guess which pastor is becoming intolerant really quickly? This pastor, this one right here, she's my wife. You say, well, Pastor Harney, Pastor Kevin, you're intolerant? Yes, I am with certain things, like people dating my wife. Suppose, besides me, um, <laughs> suppose I found out that there was somebody teaching our children's ministry here at the church, and they were teaching children that Jesus didn't die on the cross and rise again, and he doesn't pay for our sins. Guess who wouldn't be a children's teacher in our children's classes anymore really quickly? But Kevin, that's intolerant. You bet it is. <laughs> See, sometimes intolerance is exactly the right thing. We have to do it in the right spirit with kindness, but we got to make a stand. And that's what Jesus is saying to the church. You found people in the church teaching false teaching and you dealt with it. Good for you, Jesus says. You didn't tolerate it. All right? So, so, so there's, there's there, tolerance is fine if we're tolerant of the right things. Intolerance is fine if we're intolerant of the Wrong, you know, the things that shouldn't, we shouldn't be tolerant of. But let's not pretend that everyone's tolerant of everything all the time, and that would be a good thing, because it wouldn't be. There's things that are wrong, and we should stand against those things. And we have to discern what that is in our hearts and in our lives. I, I found something else as I now am watching my grandchildren start to grow up. If you attack or you're mislead or deceive my grandchildren, I'm, I'm going to stand up for them. I'm going to protect them. I had a pastor send me a thing the other day saying that there, there's an app 
for the people who use on their phones called TikTok. And some, some of you may use that. Some of your kids may use that. But this study was done. They found out that in, a, in one 13-year-old kid's account, there were at least 550 videos sent to this kid on using drugs, including methamphetamines and cocaine, to a 13-year-old. Five, over 500 videos encouraging drug use for a 13-year-old. Now, if somebody came to my house, knocked on the door and said, hey, can I talk to your kid about using cocaine? I'd, I would be very intolerant. But if they're sending it on their phone, should I be any less, you know, any less concerned? We, we need to recognize when the current's flowing away from the things of God, when people are hurting our children, our grandchildren, our generation, our people, and we've got to say, wait a minute, in the name of Jesus and with his love and grace, but with firmness and conviction, without compromising, I'm going to stand against that. There's moments where we have to make a decision to stand strong. And then Jesus goes on in verse 3. And basically says, perseverance, endurance, and strength can honor the name of Jesus. Verse 3 says, you have persevered. You've endured hardships for my name. You have not grown weary. Jesus says, you have hung in there, even though it's hard. It's hard to swim upstream. It's hard to resist all the stuff that the world is doing and what the, the current of the world. It's hard when the current moves faster and faster to swim harder and harder. And you kind of get weary and tired and say, I'm just going to tread water for a while. And all of a sudden, you just feel yourself floating downstream. And Jesus said, I know, but you've hung in there. He says to the church of Ephesus, I think he says to us today, Hang in there. Keep standing for me. Keep following me. Whatever you experience, whatever comes your way. So here's a question for you. It's a strange question. And if you tweet this out as the only thing I said today, you will misquote me and it will make me look bad and I could live with it, but I encourage you not to do it. Here's the question. What are ways we can honor God by being intolerant? That sounds like a weird question in our culture. But what are ways we can honor God by being intolerant? My dad, when he was raising me, he was not a Christian. I I grew up in an atheistic home. But my dad, when I would do really dumb or dangerous things or thoughtless things, he would say to me, I will not stand by and let you become that kind of person. He'd tell me that. And he would do all he could to keep me from going down stupid roads that would damage me and damage others. He said, I love you too much to let you become that kind of person. If you love your kids, if you love your grandkids, don't tolerate the damage our culture can do to them. Stand by them, love them, pray for them, do all you can to influence them. I'll tell you another thing to be intolerant of. Be intolerant of ongoing patterns of sin in your own heart and your own life. Don't just go, oh, I guess that's just the way I am. I'm, I'm always a gossip. I'm always, I'm always greedy. I'm always doing that. But it's no big deal. Say, no, wait, no, God, if you say that's not who I should be, I don't want to tolerate patterns of sin in me. I want to stand against that. If there's things happening in our world, our culture, that are counter to the scriptures, counter to God, love God enough, love people enough, love the people around you enough to, to, to do the best you can to stand up and say, I don't agree. When, when my friend Mark, it wasn't my friend at the time, Mark eventually became a good friend, the guy, the guy at Munchie's Pizza, who asked me about getting high and getting drunk and sleeping around, he eventually became a friend, he eventually became a, became a Christian, and he actually supported Sherry and I when we went through seminary. Talk about a changed life. But it started by him saying, what about this? What about this? What? And, I, and I said, no, no, no. At 16, that can end your friendship before it starts. But you've got to know who you are and who you believe in and stand for those things. And can I encourage you, when it comes to false teaching in the church, know what you believe. Anyone on our staff, we have a simple statement of faith that, that, re, that affirms what we believe and what the Bible teaches. And if somebody says, well, I don't really believe those things, but I'd like to be on Shoreline staff, you can't be. On our church board, you can't be. Teaching our classes, you can't teach a class unless you align with certain things because there's things that this book teaches and we're not gonna deviate from this. And you say, well, that's kind of intolerant. And I say, thank you for noticing. Um, <laughs> because there's times, there's times where you gotta say, we know what we believe and we stand on that. We also see in verse four another lesson that God cares deeply about the condition of our heart and that love is supreme in the heart of God. Listen to these words. Verse four of Revelation two. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider, think about how far you've fallen. Turn around, repent, and do the things you did at first. Get back in love with Jesus. When Jesus was asked what was the most important of all the Bible, all the law, all the prophets, you know what he said? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus said, love God and love people. Keep growing in love. Keep growing to love Jesus, to walk with him. 
Even the song that we heard sung, Abba, that, that's the, the, the ancient word for daddy, this intimate word for God and the Father. Abba, I belong to you. I love you. Follow me. You came running to me in my time of need. Keep walking with the God who loves you. Keep growing in that love relationship with him. So a question, what can we do to rekindle our first love and fan the flames? How can we rekindle that first love? Well, I would say, first of all, spend time with Jesus. If somebody says to me, I really love this person, care about them. When's the last time you saw them? Four years ago. I said, I don't know how much, how passionate that love is. You know, spend time with Jesus. Every day, block out time. Open up this book and read it and listen to the heart of God. Let the heart of God grow in you. Look at your schedule and say, what am I doing with my days? Hobbies are wonderful, but if, if, if hobbies consume all your time and you don't have time to be with Jesus, you go, okay, what, what can I set aside? What can, and it's not, it's not hard to do, to just look at your schedule and say, I'm gonna put time every day to set aside to be with time. It could be at your lunch break. Sherry's dad for years worked in, worked in a foundry and then worked in a big, steel, in a big steel company, but at lunchtime he would go to the, truck, uh, the cab of his truck, put on some quiet music, pray, read his Bible, 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes, just pull away from everything, just be with Jesus. Find that time. Rekindle that love for Jesus and grow in that. So we have a vision and we have a message. But here's the last thing. Getting a move on it. Taking action. We need to move in our lives in line with what God is doing. And so here's what I want to do. I want to pray with you. And I want to pray with you through some action. So if you would just quiet your heart with me. And just put yourself in a place of prayer. If you're big on taking notes, all of my notes for the sermon are on our church website and you can pull it up and you can see all my notes. They're actually this is there before I preach. And so, um, but, but they're there if you want to put, pick these things up. But just put your heart in a place of prayer. And I want to walk through some prayers that grow right out of this passage of the Bible. God, we thank you for speaking to the church of Ephesus and speaking to the church here at Shoreline and wherever we are gathered from, people online who are at different churches, different places, but listening to this message. God, hear our hearts as we respond to the teaching of Scripture, to the church of Ephesus and to the vision in, 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 that, that John saw in Revelation chapter 7. Would you say this to God? God, I will consider where my heart is at right now. I will reflect and think and consider if my love for you has cooled off. And God, if my love for you has grown cold, Will you ignite it again? Will you turn my eyes toward you? Will you give me a fresh love for your word? Will you help me make time every day just to seek you and sit at your feet? And Lord, if I don't even know how to do that, let me talk to a pastor here at Shoreline or at another church if I'm part of a different church and say, how do I spend time with Jesus? How do I grow in love with him? But Jesus, help us to, to fire up our passion and our love for you. Will you, will you pray this prayer as a commitment to God? God, I will repent. I will turn away from the things that I know you don't want to be part of my life. I will repent and turn away from the ways I use my words that are not kind and gracious. I will repent and turn around from ways of thinking that are judgmental and harsh and cruel. And I'll seek you for tenderness and kindness and love. God, help me turn and repent away from anything in my life that doesn't honor you. Will you dare to pray this prayer? I will change. I want to be more that person I was at first. Jesus, when I first fell in love with you, when I first just delighted to read your word, when I, when I would just sing praise songs and I didn't even know I was singing, I just was worshiping you as I went through my day. Or will you, will you change me back to, to, to recover some of those things, that, that passion, that love for you, that joy of my salvation? God, recover that within me and bring it alive. Will you pray this prayer? I will recognize and resist false teaching. Will you say, God, let me know your word so well that when someone's speaking what is against your word, I recognize it. And if they're a Christian who's confused, let me just correct them gently and lovingly. If there's someone who's malicious and hurting your church, let me stand against them, even when it's hard to do, even when it's countercultural. But Lord, help me recognize and resist any false teaching in the church and among other believers who I love and care about who but might be wandering. And then will you pray one more prayer? 
When you say, Jesus, I will walk in your victory. I will follow you. I will walk in the victory of your cross, the victory of the empty tomb, the victory of your resurrection, Jesus, and your power. Jesus, help me walk and live in your victory at all times and let you work in powerful ways through me, come alive in my life. As we close this prayer, listen to these words from Revelation 2.7. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the people of God. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Oh God, for that day we long. Until then, give us strength to stand in you and with you and for you, being loving and tender, growing in love, but being intolerant when we need to to stand for the things that honor you, Jesus. We pray this in your name and everyone said, amen. amen. Wherever you are, if you can stand with me, I'd love to send you off with a word of blessing. Um, before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you two really important invitations. Uh, there's two things coming up that you, I, I really think you'll want to be part of if you can make it work. One is today at two o'clock, we're doing baptisms. We normally do them in services and right here on campus, but once a year we do them in the ocean. And we have 10 people who are part of your church family that are getting baptized today at 2 o'clock. So it's a beautiful day to take a walk on the beach to celebrate in baptism. So, yeah, let's, let's rejoice in that. Amen. Yeah. And so if you go to our, towards the ocean, Elastero Park, and the McDonald's right by Elastero Park, there's a parking lot right there and across the street. Park right there and just walk straight to the water. You'll see a little tent. And you'll see it say Shoreline. We'll be gathering at about quarter to 2 and come celebrate baptism, then take a walk. It's going to be a gorgeous day. Take a walk on the beach, enjoy. So you've got, you've got a couple hours to go do other stuff, have some lunch, but come back and join us at 2 o'clock for baptism. And then the second thing I want to invite you to be part of is night of worship is this Wednesday. I love the first Wednesday of the month because I love nights of worship. And we are going to, we've been going through this series on what's in the name. And this week, the name we're going to look at, look at is El Shaddai, God Almighty. What does it mean to walk with a God who is the Almighty God? So we're going to have communion we are going to sing together, study God's word together. We'll be live on campus. We'll be online. So 6.15 Wednesday night, we invite you to be with us. And then finally, as always, if you need prayer today, if you've got a joy or a need and you want prayer, we would love to pray for you. If you're on campus, come in the worship center up to the front. We have teams ready to pray. If you're online, all you have to do is send your prayer need to the email address you see or call the phone number you see, and there's somebody waiting to pray with you live right now. They're waiting, so feel free to call them right now with your prayer need. And if you're new at Shoreline, if you're new online, we're so glad you're with us. If you'll text the word welcome to the phone number you see on your screen, we will get back with you. We'll reach out to you. We'll build a bridge and answer your questions. We want to give you a warm personal welcome. If you're on campus, anywhere on campus, family worship venue, outdoors, indoors, right inside the doors here is the Connection Center. Head right in there, and they want to give you a gift bag, and thank you for coming and answer your questions. Now receive this blessing as you go from here. As we close this time, as you finish online, as you leave this campus, walk in the presence and the glory of Jesus. Know his love and love him with growing passion. Know his word and hold to it. Don't only swim against the current. Stand against the current. Stand for God. Even if others don't understand. Stand for his ways. Stand for his righteousness. He will be with you. He will bless you. And the lamb in the center of the throne will be your shepherd now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you at baptism, night of worship, and next Sunday.